Well, um, can you start perhaps by giving us some background to today's lecture? Um, uh, what were your objectives? What were you trying to achieve? Those sorts of things. Okay. Um, well, today's lecture was the third lecture I've given in this course. Um, the first lecture really introduced the students to the, to the main theme, which is Shakespeare's London. Um, and we talked about uh, his relationship to the city, really, um, and the way that the city is a microcosm for Shakespeare, for the whole world. And so that kind of set things up. And then in subsequent weeks, we've been looking at specific locations each week. Um, so last week, we looked at St Paul's. In the printing industry, and we looked at Tyburn okay. and violence. Um, and then this week's location was Whitehall. Um, and the idea was to start thinking about politics, really, in Shakespeare's London. What I've what I've tried to do is construct the course so that each location has a kind of thematic connection to the play that we're looking at that week. Uh, the obvious problem for teaching a course on Shakespeare's London is that he doesn't write about London very often. Um, so I'm trying to draw out thematic connections instead. So that, that was the kind of the first aim of the lecture. Um, the other thing I was trying to do today is to start introducing um, certain ideas in secondary criticism. These are third year students, um, so I wanted to uh, introduce them the idea of new historicism um, and to question that a little bit as well. So that was obviously what I focused on in the first part of the lecture. Um, and I did that because obviously they need to be aware of different crit critical methodologies at this point in their degree um, and also to be thinking kind of sceptically about them, I suppose, from time to time. Uh, so, that, so that was the other major aim, really, for today. Okay. okay. Um, and given those objectives, how do you think the lecture went? How would you sort of do a self-assessment of that lecture? <laughs> well, um, I should say it's the first time I've given that lecture. Um, it's a new addition to the course this year. Um, I have some slight misgivings about the structure of that particular lecture. I'm not mm -hmm. sure that beginning with the uh, critical methodology stuff is actually the best way into it necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, other lectures in the course, I've tended to begin with the location stuff, uh, for which I have a lot of images, and it's, it tends to kind of... I think perhaps grab the students a bit more from the get-go. I think they, you know, that was a long run-up at that lecture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I spent a lot of time laying out context and then explaining why it was important. So I'd perhaps slightly restructure it if I was to give it again. Mm -hmm. um, but I got through all the content that I wanted to get through. In terms of practicalities, I was happy that it was the right length. I mean, just ba basic things like that actually really matter. Um, I could have been more thorough in checking my PowerPoint slides before I began, which were full of typos, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but at least it makes the students laugh. I, I don't suppose. think they were quite full of no, typos. No, there, there were a few <laughs> crucial typos. Um, so a few kind of little practical things that I, I need yeah. to improve. But the, ma the main thing would be kind of rethinking the structure of it, perhaps. Mm. Um, I wanted to begin with the Essex episode because it connected up so well to last week. Um, thinking when we thought about executions, um, but so that was why I wanted to begin because I mm -hmm. thought that would be familiar to the mm -hmm. students and they'd kind of feel like there was some continuity. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, as I say, I may slightly rethink that if I were to give the lecture again. Um, do you do you evaluate lectures as as they are happening? Do you ever sort of take a take stock of what, what the room is looking like? I do. Yes, I do. And um, I have to say, I find that I find that very difficult. Um, because uh, I've often had the experience of um, either giving a lecture where students look completely disinterested and then afterwards them coming up to me and being full of enthusiasm or I've had the reverse happen where they're really you know smiley and engaged and they laugh at any jokes but then you know sometimes they've said to me afterwards oh, I didn't really understand this bit so I, I have to say I'm, I'm really I find it very difficult to know how it's going at the time um, and I think especially this is a Monday morning 9am lecture um, a lot of the students you know if, if they're awake and following me that's that's I'm pretty happy with that <laughs> to be honest uh, and on time that's a bonus as well and when do you see them next when do you see them in seminar I see them on Friday in seminar um, and I, I I've sort of learned not to begin seminars by saying how did you find the lecture or what did you think about the lecture. I used to always start that way by saying, you know, what do you have any questions from lecture? And it it seems unfailingly to fall flat. I think students are not ready kind of from cold to reflect on the lecture and particularly to reflect in a way that might be perceived of as being critical to me. 
Um, so I so I tend not to start with that, but as we get into the kind of the body of the discussion, you know, I'll pick them up on something and I'll say, do you remember that bit of the lecture? And, and I, I find that works better in terms of getting the honest feedback on, on what they what they got from the lecture itself, I suppose. But there also seem to be a point where um, well, it seems like you're asking them to do things between mm. Monday and yes. Friday, and you mentioned that some students were going to volunteer to put things. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're, how you get them yeah. to continue thinking about the materials between Monday and Friday? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was very fortunate that the timetable worked out this way, I should say. We don't get control over the timetable here. Um, so I'm very lucky that we have got uh, the full week between lecture and seminar, so I am al allowed and able to set those kinds of tasks. Um, but what the students are doing, um, and this is a new aspect of the course this year, is that I'm having them, uh, in addition to writing a kind of coursework essay at the end of the course, they're also helping me build an online map of Shakespeare's city. And this counts for 15% of their assessment uh, for the course. Um, and a lot of the first seminar was devoted to explaining to them you know, what we were doing and how this was going to work and why it was important. The thinking behind it was... Um, well, there were, there were two impulses to do the project. One being that at King's we're interested in looking at different modes of assessment uh, because uh, obviously not all students do their best work in exam conditions or for coursework essays. Um, and the other impulse was to try and give the students some kind of transferable skills, to use a horrible phrase. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You know, they'll, they'll almost all of them perhaps end up in jobs with some web element to them. So being able to put on their CV that they've been involved in de designing a website, producing content for a website, uh, should be quite useful from that point of view for them. Um, so as I say, we're, we're building a website and um, what I've done is that the website will focus on the six key locations that my six lectures for the course focus on. Um, and I've got a group of students working on each of those locations um, and they were, uh, they were picked, they picked which location they wanted to do basically in week one. Um, and they've been asked to go away and do a bit of preliminary research about the location um, and to post it on Blackboard in advance of the seminar in which we're going to talk about that location. Um, I should say that they could do that at any point. They don't just have to do it this week. They could have done it two weeks ago, but in practice, <laughs> that doesn't seem to be how it works. Most of them post on you know, five minutes before the deadline. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so they're, they're all doing a little bit of research. Um, and then in the seminar, I begin by turning to the students who've you know, made some discoveries. Um, I tend to have a printout for my own reference of, you know, of the, the discussion the blog from Blackboard. Um, and I'll say, you know, and so, so you found out something interesting about such and such an aspect of the topic. Um, and, and get them to say a bit about what they found out. And then we use that as a starting point for discussion of the play that we're mm -hmm. looking at in any particular week. Um, and it seems so far to actually be working really well. Um, then after the seminar, I have two wonderful graduate teaching assistants mm -hmm. who um, meet with the students. And they, um, they help the group to think about... Um, the kind of web content that they're going to generate for their part of the map. Um, and the idea is that in a group of five or six, there'll be one person who'll look at, you know, some aspect of the history of Whitehall. There'll be one person who'll look at a particular figure associated with Whitehall. There'll be somebody who gets together historical images. There'll be somebody who goes there today and does a, you know, a podcast of what they can see there. Um, taking modern photographs, perhaps there'll be a walking tour. I mean, I've, I've really not put any restrictions on them in terms of the kind of content that they generate for the web, as long as they do something. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the main thing. Um, yeah, so they'll, they'll have a certain number of weeks after the seminar to produce their web content okay. it, with the assistance of the teaching assistants, and then they will um, uh, submit that, and it'll be part of their assessment, as I say, for the course. Um, so that's yeah, that's a long answer to, no, to no, the question about what they're doing between. Well, the that's classes. very interesting, and, and I and it makes um, it, it sounds like that's a wonderful way to get seminar started in terms of them speaking from their own work as opposed to, as you were saying, to yeah. thinking about lecture or feeling yeah. pressure to perhaps critique. Absolutely, um, and the nice thing about it um, in the week we've done so far is that they they felt well, they seem to feel like it had given them expertise. <laughs> Um, or kind of control over a particular aspect of the course or the topic. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, they mostly found out stuff that I know nothing about. You know, I, I'm an expert on, on these places. So um, so it was, it was really nice to be able to kind of 
um, give them that confidence boost, I suppose. Um, and I think that then made students more forthcoming in discussion mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And will the website be continue to be constructed by subsequent cohorts of your students, or are you That's thinking? Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> depending on my energy to keep writing new lectures, <laughs> the plan is that there will be different locations oh, brought see. in over the years. Oh, um, I'm writing a book version of this course, yes. um, and. So I'm kind of using the lectures as my excuse to go off and research a different chapter for the book. Um, but obviously there is isn't there is an issue there of how much of my time I can kind of constantly keep coming up with lo new locations yeah. and relevant plays. But for as long as I can, I'm going to try and keep adding to it and, and building upon it, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the idea. Thinking back to the particular lecture and previous and subsequent lectures. Is there, um, do, you, do you feel responsible for helping your students um, take notes during lecture or signposting things for them? Yeah, um, I do. I don't honestly know how successful I am at this. Um, I try as much as I can to head up and say to them this is going to be an important point, um, to point out to them the structure of the lecture. Um, I try and signpost as much as I can. Um, one thing I've seen very successful lecturers do, and I, I should probably be doing this, although I don't at present, is actually handing out the structure of the lecture at the beginning, so students can kind of follow where they're up to. Like an outline, an outline of the at the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's something that I might introduce next time mm -hmm. that I teach the course and in, into my other courses as well. I think that does work actually mm -hmm. really well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so just signposting, trying to emphasise which the important points are. Mm -hmm. um, some students just don't take notes. I noticed that. <laughs> yeah, and I don't, I don't know what to do. I think it's slightly more of a problem in this course than in other courses I teach because I think they think, you know, why is she waffling on about the history of London? Or um, why is what happened at what, with Elizabeth's coronation relevant to this? Mm -hmm. And I've tried as much as I can to constantly say in lecture, this is important because, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but they still don't write it down. So, I mean, the other tactic that I employ is just to take students to the one side afterwards and say, I noticed you won't take any notes. Do you know all this stuff already? Or, and what no, do they I say when I they do that? I don't want to say that. <laughs> um, well, often they'll say things like, oh, I was taking it all in. Um, and I try and explain to them that they might not remember anyway. Um, it's a problem. If you have any advice, <laughs> I'd be well, really it is, curious. It is hard know. because mm -hmm. some students find it very difficult to listen and at the same time take notes, and some yeah. students don't know, yes. you know what in fact is relevant yeah. part to, take, to yes. take notes on. But what, you're, what you suggested, the idea of outlining the mm. lecture, and either handing it out at the beginning of the lecture or posting it mm. on, on Blackboard and Moodle. Yes. Um, yeah. for them, and then have them suggest to them to fill in what yeah. they remember as the relevant points or what they want yeah. to note that they didn't understand X or Y mm. and to come and talk to you in one of the Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. And I, I have to say that probably the best lecturer I ever saw, somebody I worked as a teaching assistant for in the States when I was doing my PhD, mm. um, used to give the students full his full lecture notes. He'd just give them absolutely everything. Really? Um, <clears throat> and he would say, don't take notes, I just want you to listen. Um, and I'm sort of, I mean, it's a lot of work to do that, to present your notes in such a way that the students can then make use of. Yeah. But at some point, I'd like to try that because I, it, was, it was really effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it really was. So, so that's something to bear in mind. I have noticed that they tend to take notes when I talk about, when I talk about the play specifically. Which is weird because in a way my close readings of the scenes are not what's going to be most helpful to them. Uh, they need to be doing their own close readings. Um, <coughs> it's the, they should actually be taking down the contextual stuff because they're not necessarily going to get that somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know whether I should actually, probably in a seminar rather than a lecture, spend some time explaining to them mm -hmm. um, how they should be taking notes and which bits are going to be most relevant to them. Um, but it, you know, whenever I say Richard II, they will suddenly pick up their pens again and start scribbling because they think they're going to be tested on it, even though I've explained yeah. to them that the context is part of the assessment. So, yeah, well, it's something to work a lot. on. You know, that, that, that idea on. of having to re repeat yourself over and over again. Mm, yeah. um, uh, I guess this is a slightly antagonistic mm. question, but mm. would you agree with the statement that that lectures are um, sort of an outmoded uh, pedagogical form that mm. really have past their sell-by date. Um, so that's the yes or no question, and yeah. then of course there's a follow-up. 
Mm. <laughs> well, I have to say no. Mm. <laughs> um, but I have, I mean, I have various different points of view on that question. I mean, I, I think there's a real tension uh, in the students themselves between um, what they sort of think they want and what they actually want. And we're finding increasingly, as fees go up and fees will continue to go up, that the students are more and more, they say they're more and more pro-lecture because they feel, they go to a lecture, they download all of this knowledge that I'm giving them and they take it away, even if they don't take very good notes. They feel like they've got something from me, they've got their money's worth um, and they get to treasure that and store that up and that's what they're paying for. Um, so you get that attitude and, and some sort of you know, I've started to notice on course evaluations more positive about lecture than about seminar. Even though I, you know, I really prime myself and put a lot of effort into the seminars. Um, and I think that's a reflection of this kind of sense of an increasingly transactional relationship. So that's what they kind of say they want. Mm -hmm. um, but equally and obviously on the other side, we've got the fact that their attention spans are <laughs> increasingly short. They're more used to different modes of interaction. Um, sitting still for an hour and taking notes is not something that comes particularly naturally to them. Um, so, you know, as I say, there's a difference between what they say they want and what I suspect they actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. want. Um, the other thing just to say about it, um, the final thought I have on that question is that I teach a period in which um, rhetoric is very important um, and it's very important to my own research. And so I'm interested in the lecture as a form of rhetoric. Um, and I think that's why I get pleasure out of writing and delivering yes. lectures, yes. is that it's a, it's a question that I've thought about a lot. Do you talk to your students about that? You. So sometimes I do, yeah. 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 yeah, so for example, I'm currently, the other course I'm currently lecturing for is the introduction to um, the Renaissance mm -hmm. period, basically it's the course, mm -hmm. the survey course for mm -hmm. first years. And we did uh, Sydney's Defence of Poesy uh, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, and trying to explain to them, kind of as I was lecturing, how I was structuring this, um, how you know you could almost see lectures as a piece of rhetoric in themselves. Um, you know, I, I, that was that was a really, um, I think they really liked that actually. Mm -hmm. They re really seemed to respond to that that kind of approach. I've also done a very. Um, bizarre lecture on Paradise Lost, which I will do again this year, um, which is a lecture in which I try and say to them that the lecture I give is a model exam answer, because they're constantly saying to us, what should we write an exam? So I do, it, it feels almost schizophrenic to deliver because I'm, I'm giving the lecture and I'm giving a commentary on it at the same time. So I say, and now I'm going to you know, do a close reading, bringing in some of the contextual information, and then I kind of do it, and then I step back and say what was good and bad about what I've just done. Um, so I mean, that's the kind of far extreme of lecture as a piece of rhetoric, actually kind of building a commentary into the, the lecture. Um, but students said they found that really helpful. Yeah, and that, would, that sort of connects back to, to taking notes and understanding what to, to get out of, um, how to get the most out of um, yeah. the lecture. Yes, it does. Um, wonderful. And I'm also thinking if you only see them twice a week, you mm. see them for one lecture mm. and one seminar. I do. You must need that lecture to, to do the demonstrative aspect, but also delivering yeah. Information. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And is that the the, the um, standard uh, amount of teaching time? It is. Yeah, for the courses here at King's, it is. Mm. Were you ever bored in lectures as a student? <laughs> yes, I think all students are bored in some lectures. Um, and what would make you bored? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I was thinking about this uh, when you were asking earlier about um, note taking, really. Mm. Um, and I suppose the moments where I was most bored would be when I'd go to a lecture and um, the lecturer would set off and it wouldn't even be clear what the primary text was that they were talking about, much less the secondary <laughs> critics. And they'd kind of drop names in, but they'd do it really quickly and they wouldn't spell out the names or tell you, you know, show you them on a screen or on a piece of paper. Um, and some of them were lectures where we wouldn't know in advance, as I say, what the primary text even was. So you'd sit there for an hour thinking, but what are they talking about? 
I mean, it was just awful. That's such bad. So I do have a little rule to myself that any name I mention, I make sure, you know, I either spell it out or they've got it in front of Because not knowing the names is just so... I mean, it's such a basic thing to get right. But, mm. yeah. So they were the ones I was bored in, I have to say. Do we have time for two more questions? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> Are you ever, do you, we, we noticed that you used PowerPoints today and mm. um, we're wondering about new technologies and are you ever inspired to use other things other than PowerPoint, like video or podcast or things like that in your lecture? Yeah. And how does that work? Um, I haven't much used them in lecture because in all honesty, up until this year, technology at King's was so unpredictable that we'd be allocated our lecture rooms by the central timetable and we wouldn't even know that we were going to have PowerPoint actually. Um, it's really only from this past September that it's been guaranteed that every lecture hall is going to have, you know, technological capabilities. So since September 2010. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the official college line may be different, but in practice, I can tell you. <laughs> um, so it's been uh, it's been a little bit hairy trying to even use PowerPoint, to be honest, up until now. Um, but no, I'd be very I'd be very open to doing that. Um, and in seminars as well, actually, I mean, we do increasingly have classrooms where you can get online and show students things. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, having sh bits of video, um, yeah, or bringing in websites, um, I think, could be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Okay, can you say more about your attitude to PowerPoint and um, how you go about using yeah. it and what you think is a good use of it or a, or a bad use? Um, yeah, I... So I tend very much only to use PowerPoint for courses that have got a strong visual component, which this one does have. Um, I have to say, I mean, this again goes back to the boredom question. I, I find it absolutely excruciating, as I'm sure everyone does, to kind of sit and um, watch a lecture in which you know everything that's going to be said is just put on the PowerPoint, and you're literally just kind of you know writing down what's on the screen. Um, so. Uh, so I really actually avoid PowerPoint where the lecture is going to be purely text-based and in those lectures I use a handout and, and have them kind of look at the handouts instead. Um, but the great thing for, for the point of view, from the point of view of this course about PowerPoint is being able to show them all the historical images and what the clothes look like and what the buildings look like. Um, and a lot of the time, I didn't do it in today's lecture, but a lot of the time on this course I bring in historical maps. I have a wonderful um, book that's an A to Z of Elizabethan London, and I've scanned a lot of that in. And I often use that in lectures, so yeah. they can kind of picture exactly where we are in yes. the city. Yes. Um, and I should say as well, most of the students on this course are study abroad students, so they're getting to know London oh, really? for the first time, oh, and they're also getting to know Shakespeare's London for the first time. <laughs> so um, any visual aids I can give them to help them yes. literally locate themselves um, I think can really help. Um, so yeah, so I, so I use PowerPoint in quite specific contexts, I think. Really. Wonderful, wonderful. Last two questions. Um, we were wondering about sort of reusability, obviously a lot of our mm. project is about um, having lecturers share mm. their, their teaching materials. Do you ever mm. um, borrow from other people's lectures or um, either content or style or delivery modes or things like that and mm. um, is that something that you're, you've just started to do or mm. thinking about doing? That's an interesting question, yeah. Um, uh, for this course there's no element as yet of kind of co-teaching. I'm the only person who's ever taught it. I designed the course. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know I'm planned to teach it for the foreseeable future. Um, but I have very much set it up so if and when it coincides with a research leave of mine, uh, somebody else could teach it. I tend to write out my lectures very fully, partly with that in mind, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, partly just because that's how I like to work. Um, so I have, you know, I have tried to set it up so somebody else could mm -hmm. take it up and run with it uh, if they wanted to. Um, on other courses that we teach, there is a bit more kind of, you know, co-teaching and um, sharing of materials. Um, and increasingly, you know, we're realising as the London Shakespeare Centre, there are four of us who teach Shakespeare primarily here at King's. It's it's very useful when people are off on leave, you know, to have, you know, from a practical point of view, to be able to step in and teach one another's courses. And plus, co-teaching is just a lot more fun as well. I think. It's great. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so we are increasingly moving towards that model. Okay. Um, have I answered all the parts of the question? Yet? Well, not sure. it's fine. Um, um, <laughs> yeah. Jonathan might have follow up with that, but my last questions mm. for the moment are if you had um, three
three tips to give to mm -hmm. to uh, colleagues about lectures, yeah. um, what would they be? That's really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I, do, I don't have kind of three golden rules. I'm really beginning this, and I feel very cautious about kind of handing out <laughs> prescriptions because. You know, most lecturers are more experienced than I am. This is only my second year in the job. Um, I tend to, you know, the, the kind of bits of advice I have tend to be kind of the small things, like mm. when and when to use PowerPoint. Um, structure of lectures, I do think, is massively important. Um, I always divide my lectures into subsections, and so I suppose urging people yes. to do that, um, that's something I really strongly believe in. Um, and then actually... Delivery, I suppose, is the other thing. Um, I work really hard to try and um, look up as much as possible, to put as much energy into it as I possibly can, and to try and kind of constantly meet students' eyes and just you know little bits of interaction with the students. Um, and it's quite it's quite draining, and lecturing is incredibly tiring. But um, sorry, poor me, poor me. No, 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 it is. Whole no, hour no. of lecturing. No, no, it's very tiring. No, no. Um, <laughs> But I do believe that you, you, you have to work at your delivery um, because it makes a massive difference to the students, I think, and how much they take in. If you go in there and mumble and your head down, they just switch off from the beginning. Um, so I suppose, you know, uh, attending to something like that actually is, is one thing that I really value as well. I haven't given three golden rules. I've given a few no, no, random fine. thoughts. No, no, that's very helpful. That's and very lecturing helpful. insofar as I have.